Mesdames, Messieurs, bonjour à vous. Ladies and gentlemen, three countries are, are our focus this afternoon, Tunisia, Egypt and Libya. And you've been following the news. They are in the theater of operations at the present time. And this is a very historic moment that is taking place, and we're going to be focusing on this for the next panel for about one hour and 15 minutes. You will all remember one date for Tunisia, the 14th of January 2011, when the president of Tunisia left the country, President Ben Ali, and December 2010 as well, when Mohamed Bouazizi was immolated by fire. And this is the element, this was the event that uh, triggered the events, and um, President Mubarak left Egypt, another historic event, and how did that happen? Libya, the 15th of February, the beginning of the de demonstrations in Libya, of an uprising that turned into a civil war, and which is ongoing right now, and gathering speed. So we have three speakers here with us today, and I'm going to start with uh, Idad Ben Leli. You are a Tunisian, a university student, and you you have a blog. You started in 2007. And you contribute to Global Voices, a community where people can post information. This is a community of voluntary bloggers who recount what is going on in their different areas. Next to you, we have Marbun Salem. You are Egyptian. You, ha you are a blogger. You, ha you have a blog called Rantings of a Saint Monkey. And you have 5 million visitors, uh, and you 5,000, 5.5 million. You're one of the leaders of uh, uh, me and social networks, and we will talk about the importance of these social networks uh, in uh, contesting authority. And Libya, Mr. Wamed Ejani. You're the co-founder of Alpha, the American Libyan Freedom Alliance. Can you tell us what that is? Can you explain what they do? I I was formerly uh, with Alpha. It is a, a organization. It was it is an organization founded to help uh, inform and educate uh, um, about uh, constitutional democracy and about Libyan affairs. Didn't hear. Should I repeat that? Okay, Alpha was founded to, uh, I'm a former member of Alpha. It was founded to uh, inform and educate people and mainly NGOs and uh, government and about uh, Libyan affairs and with the promoting constitutional democracy. Okay. I might request that you introduce yourself more fully, can you tell us, each and every one of you, what has brought you here today? What is your past experience? Now, as you've already said, I began to blog in 2007. In 2008, I began to denounce censure on Internet. In Tunisia at the time, we had a great deal of censure, censorship. And it was the country that was ranked second in, in black holes of Internet. And I started to recount events on my blog, and I started to write for Global Voices online. And little by little, I began to know the people who were active on Internet, and I knew the different people who were advocates for human rights and engaged in campaigns. Campaigns to support bloggers and journalists or students who had been imprisoned because of their opinions and their ideas. And this, the 17th of December, when the events began in Tunisia, I started to follow Facebook and write on my blog. And I remember I wrote the, put the first posting about Sidi Bouzid on the 19th of December, 
2010. And that's how TV channels started to contact me for me to provide them with information. And I went to Sidi Bouzid d'Algeb. And when I left, there was nothing available locally because uh, our country did not allow journalists to cover events. I posted photos of people who had been killed by the Tunisian police and tear gas. Uh, was uh, being sprayed on the crowd and I was there and I put all of this on my blog on Facebook. I continued coverage of events until the 14th of J J January. Mahmoud Salem, you were also a major blogger in Egypt and were you a blogger before the events began? Four. So uh, I've been in this game for about seven years now. Now, uh, in terms of what I do, what brought me here, what happened was <coughs> the Egyptian block sphere when it started 2005, it was 30 people, and there was no freedom of speech, nobody discussing the issues. The idea of my blog was to be the voice of dissent, which is to present the other side of any argument in order to provoke debate, because that's how you get there. Eventually, uh, we became information pusher for the local media and brought them attention of like human rights abuses by the police, you know, sexual harassment of women, stuff like that. And uh, then the situation with Tunisia, and, and, but like, I have to say that as much as everybody was surprised what happened in Egypt, we were equally as surprised at what happened in Egypt because it seemed like uh, the Mubaraks were solid and solidified, and if it wasn't for the Tunisians, you know, completely making us feel inept and, uh, you know, less of a nation because they managed to get rid of their dictator in like 30 days, you know, suddenly we were like, well, you know, we gotta do this. And, you know, it took us 18. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's what we do. Uh, but, uh, but here's the thing. There is a lot of people who are saying they're leaders of the Gen 25 movement and stuff like that. The Gen 25 movement never had any leaders. At the beginning or the end, when I speak, what I present, or when I even talk to the media, I do not talk in the name of everybody. I do not in the name of myself only. And that's the interesting and frustrating part of our revolution. You know, they didn't manage to stop it because it had no leaders. But, you know, currently now, nowadays, when it's time to play politics, it becomes, you know, more problematic in terms of directing people, in terms of who gets to talk in the name of who. So, you know, I'm here talking in the name of me, I'm not talking in the name of anybody else. Just making sure of that. C'est entendu. <laughs> Got it. Mohamed El Jani, your brother's death what may not have been the trigger because you were already very active before, but how did you experience this in this context? Uh, your brother died in 2009. He had been imprisoned by the regime of uh, Gaddafi. Brother was first imprisoned in uh, 2002 because he called for democratic reforms in Libya. Um, and he and the division to help Libya, heal Libya, and uh, define its relationship with the entire world. Basically through... Uh, accountability for Mr. Gaddafi's action on, of terror, international terrorism, and also on, uh, uh, national reconciliation, dialogue among, between, uh, round table dialogue between Gaddafi and the opposition. Um, Fatih was led straight to prison, but then he was released on uh, two years later after intervention of then Senator Biden, who is now the US Vice President. After that, Fatih was uh, uh, rearrested for two weeks. After two weeks, because he continued calling, um, he was tortured. He was deprived of uh, family visitations. He was deprived of uh, his medication for high diabetes, hypertension, and heart condition. Uh, he was isolated, um, uh, denied, as I said, denied uh, by proper medical care. He, uh, as a result of this neglect, he succumbed to death. He succumbed to a comatose coma state in early May 2009. And uh, 
he was flown to, uh, to Jordan, uh, where he died a couple of weeks later, on May 4th to February 21st, uh, 2009. Um, since then, I've been trying to raise the issue in terms of uh, um, getting an investigation into Fatih's death, but it has been slow dealing with the UN. Um, add to that the Arab Medical Center in, uh, in Amman, Jordan, refuses to hand over uh, any medical records and, stuff, and, and information about Fatih. That's all. That's all. On va reparler, uh... We're going to be speaking about these events and that began on the 17th of December in Tunisia. And what is your view of what has happened in, in general terms uh, the, of Ibn uh, Amyani's uprising? I don't think that his, the burning uh, the immolation was the only element that triggered the uprising and the revolt. I think there was rising pressure in Tunisia. And I say this, before this because before the 17th of December, Tunisia had a number of other social movements. From the south, from the mining center in 2008, there were small social uprisings everywhere. But the regime added to stifle these movements by imposing a media blackout and using violence. And at this point, at Moham Hobazi's immolation triggered something because the ground was already pre-prepared. And we already had learned how to circumvent censorship uh, and overcome hurdles. And I'm now concerning television and radio, all the media are controlled by the regime. And they were not allowed to cover. So Internet took over and provided coverage. And it was through Internet we managed to galvanize people and get them to come out and demonstrate. And this we were not able to do in 2008 because Twitter and Facebook and everything were not very familiar to Tunisians at that time. Now, it's true. Is it true that you spoke about a revolution, a Facebook revolution, a Twitter revolution? Now, I'm against calling it uh, Facebook revolution or Internet revolution. If Mohammed Bouazizi's colleagues had not spoken up immediately, and if the movement had not spread a bit everywhere throughout uh, Tunisia, then the revolution would not have taken off only by using internet. Uh, internet would not have been enough, wouldn't have led anywhere. The effort and the sacrifice by people on the ground and using together with internet were responsible. Foreign media trying to analyze what happens in our countries, which is basically that uh, when they first started, when the Tunisian revolution was taking off, I was saying, you know, if the foreign media gives it one of their silly names, like the couscous revolution or something, I'll be really angry, because that's what they usually do. They don't want to explain to people the local conditions, they want to explain to people where Tunisia is on the map, for example, if you're in the States, you know, like, so they went, they went for, like, whatever, social media revolution, or, like, the Jasmine revolution. Until today, I have no idea what the hell Jasmine have to do with the yes. Tunisian people. And the Tunisians don't know either, you know, like, uh, and, and that's, that's what you're dealing with, you know, and now with Bahrain, they're like the Lulu revolution. And I'm like, dude, we're scary Arabs. You can't call it a revolution, we're creating the Lulu revolution. Okay, that's just how it is. But like, uh, you know, you have, they, they ask the same thing, did Facebook create a revolution? No, I'm sorry, this is sloppy journalism. And it's fantastic because the regime believed it. Thank you, guys. You know, they read foreign press and they think, you know, oh, the Facebook did, so what are we going to do? We're going to block Facebook and Twitter. That didn't stop the revolution. Okay, we're going to shut down the Internet completely. Shut down the Internet completely, dispel them if this was Facebook revolution, because, you know, then the people 
did the job themselves. And that's the truth about the Arab people, that they're original social networkers. You know, we go anywhere and we know everybody, you know, and everybody reaches everybody. They shut down cell phones, they shut down Facebook, they shut down the internet. We used landlines, we went and met with people, you know. And I know many people on the 28th who went down because they woke up, found no internet, found no Facebook, then find their phones working, so they got pissed off. They weren't even political, they just went and joined us. You know, but <clears throat> it's a very important myth to like, you know, play social media at its specific place. Yes, it was an important tool. Yes, a lot of the original demands had to be put on it because you can't really go on regular media and call for a revolution. You know, it has to be somewhere else and that's where the alternative media exists. But to place overwhelming importance on this or claiming that those are all part of social media or Facebook revolutions is a disservice to the people who actually like kill, who actually died, like whenever in their life, you know, even had, you know, Facebook or internet or computers to begin with. <laughs> you were in the field at the time and who went there directly. Can you tell us what you saw? Can you give us further details? What pushed you to go there? You talked about censorship uh, and uh, how the media were being controlled. Perhaps you can give us further details. I'll talk about start talking about censorship. I've, I've been censored since 2008. They started off by blocking my blog and my Facebook profile. But since I met up with uh, Tunisian act cyber activists, there were people who were who had a lot of savoir-faire in technically and they showed me how to use proxies. Uh, these, this is software to avoid uh, censorship. When we changed the IP address. I continued to write, despite the censorship, thanks to this. But uh, censorship turned into constant harassment by the police. They harassed us at my, my parents' house. They entered. They break in an entry. They took my computer and the material that I used to blog, but it gave me the desire to continue. I've worked on a number of campaigns against censorship, and the first time that we managed to persuade the Tunisians to leave the virtual world to a real world was in May 2010. There was a huge wave of censorship in 2010 in Africa, and we decided to organize a peaceful demonstration against censorship. And we managed to mobilize people, and they came out to the streets. They took to the streets, and despite the fact that the police, having robbed my own house, And we got people to take to the streets, and it was the first time that Tunisians broke this circle of fear. Now, I was on the ground. I was in Tunis, the capital. I was president of all the demonstrations showing support for Sidi Bouzid, where it all began. I demonstrated. I took... Uh, photos and filmed and I wanted everyone to know that there was something that was happening in Tunisia. And then one day I decided to go to Akashin the 8th of January I think it was because friends whom I knew on Facebook told me that things had degenerated there. But when I tried to go to Kaskin, they checked my identity card and they wouldn't let me in. But they said I could go to Sidi Bouzid because they thought it was calm there. So I went there and I saw there was a huge police presence and the army was there as well. But my friends from Dulgeb, which is 38 kilometers from Sidi Bouzid, called me and they said, the police have just killed five people. There are a lot, number of wounded, so I went there immediately.
and I was able to see the families of these people, and I took photos of the bodies of those who had been killed. And I remember that there was a 26-year-old mother who had just gone outside to bring her children in from the street, and she was shot in the back. And when she turned around, they, gave, they shot another bullet into her heart. And I went to all the families. I hesitated at first. I didn't want to take photos, but the families themselves encouraged me to take photos. And they said, we want the entire world to know what is happening in Tunisia. We want the entire world to know that a massacre is taking place now in Tunisia. So I did take the pictures, and I posted them on my blog, on Facebook, and Twitter, and I started to travel a, a bit, and I went to Tasrin, Atela, in the, in the proletariat neighborhoods, in the capital, and I tried to cover it and publish my results. Now, what was the first thing that you can think of to tell us about the reaction? Now, on the 13th, I was in a hotel on the main street of the capital where the demonstration had taken place. And I was following Ben Ali's speech. And before he finished his speech, his supporters already taken to the streets. And they were screaming, Vive Ben Ali! And I cried all night. I was following the information on Internet, but I, I was truly frightened. But the next day, when I went outside, went out to the street, I saw the people were gathering once again. And the crowd began to swell. Little by little, I gained confidence in what we were doing. And on the 14th of January, we were not able to celebrate Ben Ali's departure. We were in front of the Ministry of the Interior. We were protesting. We started to talk about a, a long-term sit-in, a few days or months bringing in food, tents, covers, blankets, water. And the, the police started to use violence and tear gas. They attacked people. And the crowd scattered. And they announced a state of emergency. I couldn't go back to the hotel where I was staying, so I went back to my parents' home in the southern suburbs of Tunis, and that night we learned about it on television. We were unable to celebrate in the street, but when I was at home with my parents, we were delighted. It was really the departure of a dictator. I'd like to ask you, Mohamed Salem and Mohamed El Jami. Were you surprised on the 14th of January when Ali left Tunisia? What was it like? By <coughs> for work. And uh, I have to say that I enjoyed, I, I completely canceled dinner plans and going out so that I can just enjoy watching him on TV, not being able to get into any country. You know, just flying everywhere, nobody taking him in. I was just like, no, because the thing is about Tunisia, uh, we knew what was happening. I mean, we were just talking about a common friend of ours, like, you know, we, we hosted his blog, you know, in Egypt for the longest time, and like, there's always been connection between our country and Tunisia in terms of the cyber, you know, in terms of cyber dissonances and like internet censorship and stuff like that. We never faced anybody as bad as what they had to deal with. God knows that their government was actually sending out experts to other countries to teach them how to do like, you know, internet oppression well. But, yeah, no, it was a fantastic day, I have to say. It was, uh, it was beautiful. It was, you know, it, it can only compare to it to the day that Mubarak left. And we got to celebrate. So, you know, we took a day off. It was probably a mistake. We took a couple of days off to celebrate. We should have just kept on going. But, yeah. Uh, 
Well, I, I was totally surprised. <laughs> I had not, not expected any of this to happen, nor did I expect any of the uh, Egyptian or the Libyan. So, so uh, this took me by surprise, but it was a, uh, it was a good surprise for the uh, Tunisian to go. And then I followed the Egyptian uh, arrest closely, and I thought it will end. Honestly, I thought it will end after three days or so. But when they continued past the uh, 28th of January, that's when I, when I looked at uh, when they got into, if you're in, in, in Egypt, if you lived in Egypt, you know that the area where Canal is Suez is, the people there have got different attitude than, than those in Cairo. They're more uh, extrovert and more aggressive. So once it hit that part of the Egypt, that's, I knew that this thing was going to have uh, steam in it. Uh, of uh, the police and the government in their, in their area on the 25th. They shamed us all. <laughs> it took us a while. I mean, uh, yeah. The Swiss people. Vous étiez sur place après pendant la fin. There, at the end of January, as of the uh, 25th to the 11th of February, for the uh, what? For the uh, revolt uh, in the square. For the 25th. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Uh, at first, you know, I have to say that in the days coming up to it, I mean, it, it got launched, the, the, the Facebook invite for this, you know, got launched right after the Tunisian revolution. And uh, at first I, I was laughing about it because, you know, who creates a revolution, you know, on Facebook? Who makes a Facebook event? You know, lots of jokes went out on that issue. Like, uh, you know, is there going to be a couples only policy? Is there going to be a dress code? Like, <laughs> what time should we come and meet and leave? You know, but... Uh, Days coming up, you know, you can't help but like, you know, uh, feel as if this time there's actually going to be something. And, you know, I've been going to demonstrations ever since 2005. You know, I've gone to every single one of them. So, why the hell not? Yalla, let's go down the street and let's play with the police a little bit. You know, and uh, next thing you know, it wasn't just the usual suspects, it wasn't just the usual 1,000 or 2,000 people. Suddenly you had like thousands of people, you know, and they're with you. And um, <clears throat> the good thing about the Khalid Said movement, which came before that, it was that it really did set the rules on how to deal in ter peacefully, you know, with the police. And it's something we've been talking about for years before that, because, you know, peaceful movements and, you know, such acts we've done, those are not new in reality. I mean, the, we're not reinventing any wheels. Many people have done them before. It's the question of the modern application and the breadth and size of the movement and how people manage to deal with this. You know, and uh, it was very interesting to see how, <coughs> the, how you can do this peacefully, without weapons. Because I remember a while ago I was just saying that anybody who is dealing, who's talking about change in the Middle East with the dictators that we have, we're not talking about I mean, the local population is probably killing themselves. And that was a truism that happened all across the region. But apparently, if you have enough of the people with you, you don't need weapons. So that was good. But yeah, on that day we got I got beaten by sticks, we got tear gassed. It was, it was pretty funny. I, uh, I got people to change, like we were going through one, one, uh, one bridge across the Nile, I got them to take another bridge. Then I decided I didn't really want to like, walk across the bridge, so I took a boat <laughs> in the Nile, took the scenic route, you know, went down to the other side, right in front of the Harrier, my friends were calling me, they're like, we're getting beat up right now. I look behind me, people who went up the bridge are coming down, I'm like, I have 10,000 people with me who are coming. <laughs> and uh, we took care of it the first day of 25th, the 28th, but the end of the 25th we got uh, kicked out of the square on midnight. They had shut down all cell receptors there and like, they attacked people on like 12.30 when it was at the weakest. That's why on the 28th we went in prepared. But everybody who could do something did it. We went and, like me and my friends, went uh, to the sports mall the day before and we decided we we're going to be a tear gas catching squad. We went and got goalie gloves, went and got gas masks, went and got, you know, uh, goggles and everything. And, uh, of course, the, the big canisters, the big spray canisters filled with vinegar and sometimes Coca-Cola. Thanks for the tip, by the way. The Tunisians were sending us tips through Twitter. And uh, just an FYI, using Coca-Cola on your face right after getting tear gas removes the effects of tear gas immediately. The tip that we found out as well, using like, you know, stomach gas medication in water, spraying it on your face right after you get tear gas, works better than Coca-Cola. 
Just an FYI, in case anybody ever gets tear gassed here. So, no, at 28th, we got, I got, like, on 28th, I got shot at with, like, rubber bullets, live ammunition, everything. And, and what happened afterwards with the withdrawal of the police, you know, and the unleashing of the coordinated thugs attack, and, like, a lot of the police basically just changed their uniforms, and they started attacking us with semi-automatics and guns. That's when we started creating, like, the local militia, local neighborhood militia. Uh, and, you know, I don't, need, I don't even need to tell you, like, you probably, you guys probably watch a drama from outside, 18 days filled with thugs and guns and fires and camels and fire, fighter jets flying over Tahrir and psychoticness. The, the guy had completely lost his mind. So, yeah, I know. The 25th was interesting. The 28th was, it, was when it really happened. Sur Internet. Internet. What did you do? How did you transmit all these events? I said, uh, in terms of the Internet, the first event, yes, we had a Facebook, uh, Facebook event, but nobody really went to that page after understanding what the objectives were. And they were very interesting objectives because they weren't not ideological. You know, it didn't really call for, for example, like the... You know, the, any kind of political issue that people did not agree on. It was basically very much, you know, getting rid of the regime, starting a new constitution, this and this and this and that. So it was interesting because you couldn't say that uh, it was a leftist movement or a right-wing movement or an Islamist movement. It was, it was basically something that unified all Egyptians in that sense. It didn't matter which background you came from, you know. Uh, but uh, the use of it, where I came from, it was mostly Twitter. And Twitter is fantastic because now that you have smartphones and you have really cheap data plans, it becomes a very useful tool to keep you up to date on what's happening all across Egypt, all across the region, and also let you know where the action is or, you know, where the violence is so you can avoid it. You know, so that's what I did. You know, everywhere I go, whatever I was doing, I would make sure that, you know, I would take a minute to just, okay, right now, I want to get shot by the police. I don't come to the Gala Bridge, you know, like stuff like that. Or come to the Gala Bridge, let's meet the police, whatever, you know. But so that became it, you know, it's just the extension of the concept of information pusher, you know, from, you know, the regular channels, you know, media channels to everybody, you know, because that's how we found out what's going on. And it's a medium that allows you to eliminate rumors very quickly because, you know, if you're there, you're seeing something, you can take a picture using your phone. Eventually, this is, there's, it, it needs to be resolved, and uh, hopefully there is either through a... Uh, a no-fly zone, or it's... Ça vous révolte de voir que depuis... Does that revolt you? To know that uh, after all these days the international community has met and has still hasn't been able to come up with an, an agreement that things are being dragged out? Does that frustrate you? <coughs> Excuse me, it's just frustrating, but it is a reality. Of, um, of working when uh, or political work, it is, it, it, it's not evaluated over a short period of time. There's always sit-backs. Every, every country has its own priorities and their agenda, it's its own agendas. The problem with uh, the Libyan situation is Mr. Gaddafi played on the fears of illegal immigration and radicalism. But when you look at his policies, he's actually, these policies that he has are the ones that gave rise to these two issues. In terms of the radicalism, uh, Libyans uh, were followed, most of them followed the Sunusi order, which was a very form, uh, a reform order. So instead of building, Gaddafi building on this tradition, he went to the Wahhabi uh, uh, sect, which is, uh, has got saturated the media and with things like um, you're all member of a flock, and every flock has its own shepherd. Um, things like you have to, you have to follow those in command, etc. So it is that, in a way, that that helped foster the radical agenda and, and radicalism. Um, the illegal immigration, there is, it's known common knowledge within Libyan Libyans that uh, Libyan security benefits from. Uh, shipping the illegals across to uh, uh, Europe. So he used both as a pressure tool, and I can understand why the hesitancy. In addition, the fact is, as, as I mentioned, there is absence of civil society in Libya. They don't want, uh, you know, they always the Somalia 
uh, uh, scenario is in, is in their eyes, and nobody wants to have Somalia on the Mediterranean or like 30 minutes away from, uh, uh, by plane from, uh, from Italy. So that, that, that explains the, uh, the hesitancy. In the foot <clears throat> at this point. I mean, with all the respect to, you know, lots of the foreign governments and some of their representatives might even be here in the room. Uh, sooner or later, Libya is going to get rid of Qaddafi. Okay, this is a matter of time, simply speaking. I mean, right now you see good days, you see bad days, but in reality, even if Qaddafi manages to squash, you know, the, the rebellion that's happening right now, there is not a single country of people ha sitting here will be comfortable dealing with him after this. It's over. The game is over. The game for the businesses who are going to go for it is going to be over as well. All right. So the stupidity of such government is that they don't take the side of the people immediately. And mind you, I understand your politics. You've got to stick with your allies. But if your ally is Qazafi, at this point, it might be good for you to sell him out. It might be good for you to start. Mind you, we're not saying send in troops. Nobody wants troops in there. You know, but, you know, send in medical supplies. You know, send in weapons through the borders or just drop them off, whatever. I mean, you can do that. You can make sure that you block, you know, the, 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 the maritime routes of the ships coming in with his, with his uh, power. You can make sure that you pressure the countries like Chad and Shafi in order not to, like, help him or send him, like, you know, mercenaries or fighters. You can do a million and one things that could put you on the side of the people. And the people will not, you know, forget it. People remember those who stand by them. Like currently Libya, like, you know, our governments, the Tunisian government and the Egyptian government currently in their current form can't really offer any kind of government assistance. But like, you know, the Tunisians have been helping from day one from their side. We've been helping from day one from our side as people, you know. And uh, Americans, like right now, they're trying to score points with us. So they sent in planes to get the Egyptians who are in Libya back to Egypt. The French are doing the same thing. The British are doing the same thing. Nice, do something for Libya. Because they're going to get rid of their dictator and they're going to have shit loads of oil, and guess which countries they're not going to support. They're not going to let their companies come in and invest if they don't do that. So, try to be smart for once, instead of the stupidity that plagues all of you. Mohamed Al Jami. Mohamed Al Jami, do you agree with this, that Gaddafi will fall and it's, no lo it's just a question of time now? Do you agree with Mohamed Salam that Gaddafi will be falling, it's just a question of time? Um, you know that every, everything uh, comes to an end, I guess. So <laughs> that's just life. We're all going to die somewhere, someday. But uh, you know, at what cost and how many people he's going to talk with him? I mean, one one Libyan told me that uh, Gaddafi made a point that uh, when he uh, when he arrived to power, Libya only had uh, two millions, and now Libya has. Uh, but now Libya has six and a half millions. Does, now, does that mean he, he wants to finish off four and a half millions? I think this man is dangerous. I think he has a messianic bend in, into him. Some of the stories I hear, uh, especially uh, on the uh, uh, village of Nofalia, what happened, um, is really, is really uh, frightening. Um, there is, uh, this is a, a narcissist and he, who would just, as... Uh, the, uh, the ambassador, uh, Libyan ambassador to the UN, eloquently described it. They said only Gaddafi gave um, one option to his people. Either I rule you or I kill you. So it's just it's, uh, um, how, you know, how, uh, uh, it depends on how, how people are, uh, succeed. Now he's turning the tide. He's much more equipped. Uh, the, uh, the, um, the rebels are, war, are, are, are losing after a few gains. If he pushes uh, toward Benghazi, which is the second largest city, um, could be great atrocities here. You know, highly, uh, highly populated area. There is, by relatively speaking, in Libyan terms. And, um, you know, that's, uh, if, if this is not dealt with, uh, do we... We could be looking at a, another Hama, which was what happened in, or, or in, in Syria in the early 80s. 30 or 50,000 people died, I guess. Mm. 
I, you know, eventually, in terms of his, his, in the, eventually, yeah, eventually he will go. He will go, but the question is, it's really not he will go or not. It's at what cost? Mm -hmm. What's the cost of him leaving? In 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 ideal world, in ideal world, would like to see a negotiated settlement in this because that saves oil. We're seeing destruction to the oil infrastructure. We're seeing destruction to the to real estate. We're seeing destruction to people. We're seeing people killed. No one is winning. Uh, but, you know, is Mr. Gaddafi, can we trust Mr. Gaddafi to, for, in a dialogue? When my brother called for a dialogue, he was killed. Uh, when uh, uh, the Abu Slim prison massacre, the Abu Slim prisoners uh, called, asked for why they were held, there was a mass killing. Uh, Mansour Akikia believed in dialogue, and all he wanted was dialogue, peacefully. He was kidnapped and killed. Uh, and and Mansour Akikia was one month away from, uh, or a couple of months away from being a U.S. citizen. It's any time uh, an entity, or even an individual, threatens the rule of Mr. Gaddafi, uh, they, 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 they disappear. They, 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 that's, that's just the way it is. Libya is the center, and uh, if they fall, will, what will happen to the flow of uh, liberty and freedom to other countries in the Middle East? If Gaddafi falls, or, or let's say that he doesn't fall. Will that prevent the wind of freedom to blow into other Arab countries? Will countries will say, oh, well, Qaddafi still is there, and that will hinder uh, the wave of freedom from sweeping across other lands? I don't think that is going to be an issue uh, because... Each, each country has its own characteristics, and each country has its own level of uh, political and uh, economic problems. And each country has its own uh, civil society as well. Uh, so if, if, if you talk about a country like, uh, for example, Morocco, uh, Morocco has a thriving uh, civil society compared to Libya. Uh, has a traditional uh, uh, monarchy. He's been there for hundreds of years. So uh, I think the, the main problem really in the, in the Arab world is the youth. And this has been going on since, not, this is not new, this has been going on since the early 90s. Um, all the institutions in the Arab world is, is just a fail. Uh, I, I once listened to a report that Israel was concerned of its security because what you've got is you've got all these youth, the unemployed. Uh, what would happen? What would happen if there is a if there is a famine uh, or anything? Um, Europe is close by. In the absence of uh, um, democracy or anything, the confrontation can be can be will be violent. But if there is a democratic system where there's government for the people and by the people. The economic pie is much bigger than they have right, than, than exists right now in the Arab world. Then um, the confrontation will take on a political nature, and that can be resolved. Um, so the wind of change will continue, uh, and it will also continue in Libya. It's just Libya, Libya will take uh, longer than, 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 uh, than other places, maybe. Does the fear exist that these countries will become extremists, either Tunisia or Egypt? Uh, yes, yes, of course there's a risk. This extremi extremists uh, have come back to Tunisia and they are active uh, on site. Also on internet, there's a cyber militia that insults people and threatens activists. 
But I'm optimistic. Tunisians have shown and continue to show that they won't be pushed around, that they will protect the revolution. And Tunisians who really desire freedom and democracy will not allow these extremist movements to get a hold on power. You mentioned Internet. What kind, of, what kind of actions are taking place? Well, they work together in a group. Uh, for example, on Facebook, they attack the cyber activists on the group Facebook and the pages speaking about democracy, secularism, freedom, etc. And they make threats. They're doing all that. Is it a minority? No, no. In fact, it's not a minority. There's a large number. On the Internet, they're everywhere. On site, there have been a number of marches for equality between men and women, marches for secularism and freedom, and extremists, extremists uh, intervened, and they were violent in the street. They tried to beat people up. But we're resisting. Send it. Okay, you don't face the regular social media criticism of you cannot verify. No, no, no. Now you can verify. Very easily you can verify. If I'm there and you're there and you're saying something and I'm saying something different, I'm going to say what I'm saying. And I'm going to support it by pictures and I'm going to support it by a video and I can... And all of this is available now and applicable on Twitter. So that's where I came from specifically. Ce vent de liberté qui a souffert. Now, the winds of liberty that blew from Tunisia to Egypt and that also affected Libya, what would you call it? How is it perceived? It, we in Europe said that what started in Tunisia wouldn't uh, happen in Egypt. The countries were too different, but it did happen. And, and are there differences between Tunisia and Egypt? What are they? Size. <laughs> <laughs> you speak French? I don't know. <laughs> no, that's a, that's about it. Please, you're the Tunisian. You can tell them. En fait, moi. In fact, I saw that as of the first day, the Egyptians were there. They supported us when they started to talk about their revolution. I believed in the revolution. I knew it would be successful, as it had been in Tunisia. I don't see the difference. Both peoples were living under the yoke of a dictatorship. They were both oppressed. And one one fights for freedom, and one believes in it, you succeed. They had set an example, and I knew it would be successful in Egypt as well. Uh, about this, about what's happening right here, right now, it's quite interesting for us, because you're seeing that uh, it's coming very clear that all the animosity that happened between people were basically pushed by governments, not the people. You know, for example, Egypt and Algeria had serious issues two years ago, and... Uh, you know, as much as we were animus towards Algeria, we were like, dude, Algeria, you know, we support your right to be free, go for it. Like, overthrow your own dictator and stuff like that. The same thing, for example, with Iran. You know, there were, you know, we, we might have issues with the Iranian government, but we have nothing as the Iranian people. The same way it goes every other country in the region. And I think that's what the most interesting thing about the Middle East right now. It's not going to be that the people hate each other, it's that the governments have issues with each other. You know, and like, uh, if we're talking, for example, as Israel, the problem with Israel now in Egypt isn't that, like, you know, we're facing with the problem of, you know, the, the regular animosity or whatever. No, the problem is that the number one supporter of the Mubarak regime staying in power has been the whole government. At the same time, you find out that, you know, <coughs> leftist Israelis inside of 
Tel Aviv, you know, are watching TV and they're like chanting Shabi Vidas Qatan Nizam, which is people want, uh, you know, to bring down the, the regime. And they're going on demonstration against Netanyahu right now, carrying signs that says Erhal Erhal in Hebrew, which means, you know, leave, leave. So, and this is where, you know, and this is, it's interesting because, you know, you're seeing the same thing with Iran, you know, like everybody tells you that the Iranians look like the Arabs and the Arabs don't like the Iranians. You know something, honestly speaking, uh, we believe that the Iranians should be equally as free and strong as independent as they wish, and if they can overthrow the Mullah regime, whatever, all power to them. The same thing with Saudi, the same thing with everybody. Currently, right now on Twitter, you know, I got people asking me to like support the Azari revolution and the Armenian revolution and the revolution in Gambia and revolution, whatever. And, you know, I'm not a person who, who now, after what I've been through, I'm not one to say, no, I can't, I can't support this or this doesn't concern me, this is not the Middle East or this is not, you know, th th those people are not like Muslims. Or, no. You have to support everybody equally. And that's, that, I think that's the fundamental change that we're seeing right now, is that the focus right now, for the first time, is not on real politic, but on how do you engage the people. Because the governments and the regimes, the ages of the government and the regimes, who are in control despite the power of their people, is fading. And anybody who's counting on that is, is going against the tide of history and is going to be eliminated. So one should focus really on that. Lina Benmeni, la suite. Lina Benmeni, we saw that the fall of Benjamin it was not enough to contest the temporary government that was put in place uh, and for now to do you think that uh, democracy can be restored yes I think uh, it is a possibility it is feasible we haven't fought for naught that's what we're fighting for it's true that uh, demonstrations have continued, and this is a good sign, in my view. Tunisians are aware of what's happening, and they will no longer accept to be manipulated or to have their freedoms infringed upon, and that's why the demonstrations are continuing. We will have a constituent assembly. We will have elections in July. The picture is not very clear right now. We have a n number of uh, new emerging political parties. We don't know their political platforms yet. We're trying to understand and keep abreast of the situation. I think we're politically mature and intelligent, and we will be able to set up a true democracy. Do you think that this will happen through youth? Young people played a very important role in this revolution. Even political decisions, I think, will involve young people. Youth are very active in political life now. They're trying to understand, keep a pace, put pressure. And yes, I think young people will be involved, and they should have the right to speak their minds. I'll ask the same question regarding Egypt. The future of the country, democracy. And that uh, is that it's very unpredictable. You know, and uh, the biggest challenge in any country that... Uh, has gone through the transformation that we've gone through is we have two big ones. Number one, the removal of the concept of the big daddy figure, you know, the head of the state. That's, that's psychologically, that's a very big one. That's a very big problem because people get used to the concept of, you know, the, 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 our president, our father, you know, the father of the nation, Sharifi, and, the, you know, and the idea of no dude, he's just a civil servant, you pay him, you know, you can insult him if you want. For them, that's still unbreakable. You know, uh, that's number one. Uh, number two, the other issue uh, lies in the idea that uh, the, it's never the problem of democracy isn't about having elections or conducting elections. True democracy is about losing the elections gracefully. You know, and the issue comes along 
like right now we have a referendum in Egypt. The military has set a date for the referendum. It was for like, you know, constitutional amendments. And a lot of us don't like the constitutional amendments. One aspect of it is that it said that any, any president of Egypt has to be born of an Egyptian father, an Egyptian mother, and married to an Egyptian woman. And first of all, nobody helps who their parents are. Secondly, we don't understand why they want, like, I mean, the woman, why the hell should I have to marry? Like, are they trying to help the single girls in Egypt? We don't understand why someone's love has to be an aspect of it. But that's the military, and they believe that that's how you define like, loyal sh loyalty. That somehow, you know, if you're half Egyptian, you're less loyal than an actual Egyptian, which is absolutely racist. And the last time we heard about the purity of loyalty was in Nazi Germany. So we're against that. Uh, and <clears throat> but there is a possibility, and not to mention that the Constitution, that they want to amend the Constitution that gives a lot of power to the president, whoever is going to come next. And we don't like this. We want a completely new Constitution from the beginning. So right now we're campaigning for a vote no on the constitutional amendments, but there is a big possibility we might lose. Why would we might lose? Well, because some people are saying this is the fastest way to get rid of the military being in charge of the country. Some people are saying, you know, uh, this actually, like, you know, just saves us time and effort, and, you know, we can just move on. It's, it's, it's a clear way, whatever. And some people th seem to think that they're going to go there and vote for, the, vote for the president on the 19th. They have no clue, you know, what's going to happen. The question becomes, if the vote yes passes, what are we going to do? I'm from the point of view, like, we need to set a precedent and not protest, you know, the result of the first democratic referendum that happens in Egypt. What we need to do is to go vote, and we need to ensure that it is fair and free and not has been, and not has been tampered with. And those are the little lessons that you're dealing for, with. You know, those, the, the issue isn't, you know, whether or not who's going to take over the country in six months, who's going to be the president, or what kind of parties we're going to have. The issue is how do you create the institution and the process, and getting people used to the institution and the process. Once you have that set in stone, everything else is easy. Current events today focus on Japan and Libya, the war that is continued. The loyalists to Gaddafi and the dissidents. Do you have contact with people who are there in the field? The problem with Libya is that a lot of the communication has been cut off. There is a lack of phone services, lack of internet. Um, it is very hard. The, um, Libya is much different than, uh, than Egypt or Tunisia. Colonel Gaddafi eviscerated all kinds of civil society uh, over f nearly 42 years of rule. In Libya, um, assembly, peaceful assembly, or belonging to a political party or independent Egyptian union, are crimes punishable by death. That's how Mr. Gaddafi instituted. There is a collective punishment law, which is the state could could punish a single individual or a group of individuals, um, uh, an entire city or region, for the wrongdoing of an individual or group of individuals. Um, Libyans, as you could watch from all this violence, has been are accountable to a vast security apparatus, and uh, they're, uh, if they fail this scrutiny, they're punishable by the uh, ruthless death squad, which called the Revolutionary Committee, or you can, we know now seeing the mercenaries being hired. So the, the, um, the, that's why the, uh, the Libyan case is uh, uh, a lot more violent. Uh, in addition, uh, but there's similarity with the, with the Egyptian and the, its uh, Tunisian counterpart is the youth movement. And they, that's, that's all throughout the Arab world. This has been going on for a while. Um, there is uh, high unemployment among youth. There is just a state of uh, hopelessness due to the weakness and the corruption of the existing regimes. Um, now, the current Libyan situation, for every passing day, it's for the advantage of Mr. Gaddafi. And if, you know, right now, it's either, um, it's a, basically a crapshoot. If he wins, then he will not be able to rule Libya like before. But there's also a risk of uh, rise in the radical, radical agenda, radicalism. Um, 
if he, uh, the, the issue is, there appears to be a stalemate. If things stay as it is, he controls the West and the rebels control the East. Um, and uh, how are you going to do? Are you going to partition Libya or not? Uh, on ideal circumstances, you want the, the bloodshed to stop. And that's the problem with a spin like Japan, because Japan is a, is a major crisis. And that could, could uh, hamper any involvement by the international communi community, particularly the UN. So, uh, you know, we wish that you, that's not to be swept under the rug. The Libyan population has suffered a lot greatly, and it is at risk. Uh, of suffering more, there are, you know, according to the Libyan League of Human Rights, there are thousands of people dead, and there are many more wounded. Um, it is, uh, you know.